Thank you, everybody, for joining our RB Nug meetup today. We're excited to have all of you here in 2023. Happy New Year, everybody. We have a fantastic presentation lined up by Brian on WebAssembly in and out of the browser. Brian is a liberal arts educated uh, software engineer with a focus on forward leaning technology. His experience has spanned many industries, including retail, banking, online games, defense, finance, hospitality, and healthcare. He has a BS in computer science from College of William Mary and lives in Auburn, California. He focuses on web architecture, resource-oriented computing, social networking, the semantic web, data science, 3D graphics, visualizations, scalable systems, security consulting, and other technologies of the late 20th and 21st centuries. He is also an avid reader, devoted foodie, and has excellent taste in music. If pressed, he might tell you about his international pop recording career, which sounds really kind of interesting there, Brian. You'll have to tell us about that. Uh, take it away, Brian. Thank you for being with us here today. Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I kind of wish I could be there because I am originally from Virginia um, and I miss it uh, many times. Spent a fair amount of time down in the Roanoke area. Um, I dated a, a girl from there when I was in college, but my family also has a, a house up in Basie, just north of Mount Jackson. So uh, sometimes when I would go back to school, I would head down to 81 and then cut across 64. And, um, so I want to I talk a little bit about my background because that's relevant to my interest in um, kind of how I came to WebAssembly. Um, back in 1995, 1994, 1995, I worked at a company in uh, Alexandria called Autometric. It was a defense contracting company. And one of the first things that uh, I worked on was a whole earth visualization environment. It was one of the first commercial ones out there. It's called Edge. And... Um, it was, it was very cool. We were doing uh, handling terabytes of terrain information, hyperspectral imagery, pulling video frames off of predator drones and things like that. And so this was like really hardcore computer science to me. Um, it was all C++ based. Um, it all required silicon graphics workstations and everything. And um, when, at the time, like I said, we all had to have um, these very expensive workstations, but within two years, it ran on a PC with a GPU. And at the same time, scientists started looking around at what was happening in the video game space and the 3D graphics space and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want that too. Why do I have to buy these stupid supercomputers and their workstations um, when uh, the uh, 3D graphics and game people don't have to? And so they started pretending to do 3D graphics. And um, eventually NVIDIA and the GPU companies would say, you could have said something, you know, here, here's an API to use to invoke the, the behavior. So that was one of my first really big um, exposures to the impact that um, hardware could have on, on this kind of acceleration. But it was also um, a bit of a education because while I've been using the web since it came out, like I was exposed to Mosaic the week it came out uh, while I was still in school, and I love the web and I've, I've been talking about hypermedia and semantic web and linked data and stuff like that my entire career. But good Lord, did I not want to be a menu engineer, right? Like early days of JavaScript felt like um, just nothing, nothing serious compared to the kind of stuff that, that I was doing. But obviously things have changed, right? And the web has evolved as a platform. Browsers support a wide range of standards. And a big part of what we're trying to do is to improve the experience of the, the client side um, development part of, of the web. So the other part of my background that I want to mention was a couple of years later, I was the first engineer at a company in Reston, Virginia um, called Parabon, and we built an internet distributed computing platform. So it was a preemptive Java based system. Uh, we did machine learning, Monte Carlo based digital rendering. Um, we did uh, gene sequence comparison systems that would scale linearly. Yeah, it was all really kind of hardcore stuff. But um, I drew a distinction between like that stuff and people who were developing for the web. Now I tracked it the entire time. And I, I desperately wanted to find a way to, to get into web development. Um, I mean, not that I didn't know how, it's just the techniques and the tools and the languages and everything just drove me, drove me crazy. So I, I wanted to find a way that I wouldn't lose my mind. And I gotta tell you, jQuery and Angular and Angular 2 and React and Svelte, and none of those were the right way. I found them annoying, confusing, you know, just whatever. So huge fan of the web, 
huge fan of standards of the web, but just never really kind of drawn in to, to actual development on the web. And then about 10 years ago, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, I started to hear some rumbling about um, a new thing that Google was doing called Native Client, and they abbreviated it as NACL, N-A-C-L. And I remember seeing the demo and I was kind of blown away about it, but their approach to improving the quality of the development experience um, in the browser was to throw away the DOM and the browser and pretty much everything else, which was kind of a non-starter. And so people said, okay, 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 okay. Well, there's a portable version of it. It's called Pinnacle, so p -nackle, um, that were, both were LLVM based, but one was sort of a, a direct IR port and one was, was um, a more native client version of it. And again, it really caught my attention, but it threw away too much. So Mozilla started to do some experimentation with something called ASM.js, and this caught my attention. They were interested in, in video games. I had spent a year in the, the video game space. That's what took me to California in the first place. My, my wife was from there, but we moved to LA. Uh, I, I worked for Riot for a year, built the match, matching making algorithm for League of Legends. Um, and the uh, driver behind a lot of the ASM.js stuff was to improve the quality of the gaming experience on the web and to allow resources that may have normally only targeted consoles or PCs to maybe reach into more um, uh, other um, other techniques like bringing it into the browser, which again, would have been a really cool thing to do. And so I got very excited by some of the demos that I saw from them. And then I looked at what they were doing and it was this God awful subset of JavaScript that was ahead of time optimizable. Um, and I thought, okay, this is, this is not the way to go. But at least it showed that it was possible to do some really cool stuff um, in the in these results. Um, so out of nowhere, about a year or so later, suddenly there was this announcement about, uh, I don't remember if I heard about the community group first or the working group, but pretty soon, Brendan Ike is announcing this WebAssembly stuff and saying, oh, by the way, you know, Apple and Google and Mozilla and Microsoft are all interested in this. Suddenly it was like, whoa, this is, this is a big step forward. And so I started talking about it professionally in 2017, knowing that it was way, 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 way early, but I wanted to start to paint the picture about what was coming because I think that also helps frame some of the, the choices that we, we talk about um, in, in terms of, of our career. Now, let me take a step back and say, um, I have never really been much of a .NET developer. I have spent some time on some pretty serious projects. Um, another company that I worked for um, before moving to Cal California, um, I worked with a team that was building a very early uh, attempt to stitch together 2D images into 3D scenes. And the use case was for like special ops forces. If there were a hostage situation at an embassy overseas, these folks would hop on a plane and get over there. And the idea was on their way over there, they could do sort of mission rehearsal planning through 3D renderings of the, um, the embassy. And, and whatnot. So they could they could be familiar with the buildings and doors and passageways and stuff like that before they, they landed there and had to, to explore it. And coincident with that project was another project that um, was helping people plan for sort of post 9-11 types of attacks on physical buildings by like filling trucks with explosives and driving them up to the, the building and exploding them. And so we wanted to have a scenario environment. So it was a 3D scenario environment, um, but also to start to use some actual phys physics models about explosions and the impact on certain materials, uh, glass and concrete and, and whatnot. So you could start to build some scenarios where we could put barriers up and then therefore the truck can't get that close and therefore there won't be um, the risk to human life in, in the building uh, accordingly. And because this was targeted, uh, one, one other part of it that I wasn't involved with, I just, I feel compelled to, to mention just because it's so weird. Um, the buildings weren't the only things that would blow up in an attack like that. And so they wanted to have some modeling of how human bodies responded to explosions as well. And so there was one part of the contract out in New Mexico to blow up cadavers. And that was, that was not my part of the project. And I, I didn't want to have any part of that project. But the, the main part was, you know, these tools were going to be Windows oriented um, because they were going to be used by military people and, and whatnot. And they weren't using Macs and Linux and anything yet. So .NET seemed like a really great uh, approach, but because of the performance characteristics and what we were trying to do, um, 
we it was all managed C++ and then wrapping that with C Sharp libraries. And it was a very successful project, but um, there was a lot that kind of had to go in to get the performance out of it. Like, this is 2002 uh, kind of time frame. To, to, to build a system like that um, still had to be basically C++. Um, and then it would take advantage of the, the capabilities of the .NET platform. So that was sort of my my first real exposure to to that. But I've I've tracked things since then, you know, mono and various other things. Um, so it's, it's not that I'm at all antagonistic to it. It's just I haven't spent a whole lot of time in that space. Um, but what we're seeing now is some interesting intersection around these worlds, where .NET and WebAssembly are bringing .NET to the browser into entirely new environments uh, in ways that really kind of surprised me. I didn't anticipate that that was going to going to be the case. So um, that's I just wanted to touch base on, on some of the, the background that, I, that I've had. As uh, far as the international pop recording artist, um, I, I finally admitted it on my Mastodon profile. So I'll, I'll let you you go check that out um, on, on your own. But if you are familiar with the, the song Rasputin by the band Boney M, uh, I sang with them as a kid when I was in Germany. So that's my, my take home, my, my, my rock star. Uh, experience. I mostly put that in there just to see if anybody's paying attention, because if people don't pay attention, that they never bring it up. So thank you for paying attention. Uh, relevant to today, um, last December, so just over a year ago, I completed a book um, for O'Reilly called WebAssembly: The Definitive Guide, and there was a lot of excitement as as I was writing it, but the only real pushback I got was on the title. They thought, you know, it's it's premature to have a definitive guide for such a new technology. But the reason I, I still stuck with it, I, I abused the title a little bit. Um, and that's because most people's understanding of WebAssembly is specifically limited to getting this stuff into the browser. And that is only one part of the story. So I want to I want to convey the larger part of the story to you today, particularly because that's where the, the .NET intersection, I think, becomes even kind of more interesting beyond what it's already there. And so when I talk about the definitive guide, I meant all the use cases, not just um, targeting the browser as as a platform use case. Um, people ask, that is a Norwich Terrier on the front. I have two Norwich Terriers. That's Freya on the left and Loki on the right. Um, and as far as I know, I'm the only author who's ever gotten to choose their own um, animal on the front of an O'Reilly book. I didn't know that that was a thing. I just assumed that the authors got to choose their, their, their animals. And I justified it by saying that the Nourish Terriers are the smallest working dogs. So they're not they're not toy poodles or anything like that. They, they're working dogs, they're ratters, um, and they are safe, fast, and portable. So they they ran with it and created a great uh, an image. So there we go. It's very fitting. Thank you, thank you. So 2017, February of 2017 is when the MVP went live. And the scope of what it included is basically contained in this portion of Lynn Clark's fantastic cartoon introduction to the, the plans for WebAssembly. Um, if you're at all interested in the space, I encourage you to, to follow her on social media and read her blog because she's, a, she's an excellent communicator. And so the MVP needed a couple of things. It needed a compilation target. And you can think of this at like CIL or Java byte, byte code or something like that. But it is a set of instructions that target a, an abstract stack machine and um, the idea is you can represent, you know, arbitrary computation on a stack machine, but it is easily translatable into the instructions set of a real chipset like x86 or ARM or M, the M1, the M2, Risk Five, anything like that. Um, and so what we end up with is portable code that also runs rather fast, and it does so in in the browser case in the sandbox environment of the JavaScript environment, mostly because they didn't want to start from scratch. They already had pretty decent research and security analysis around the, the software fault isolation and, and everything that was there. Um, but it was also encoded in a binary representation. So there's a, a binary module. The idea there is it's about you know 20 to 30% smaller than it would have been if it were sort of textually represented, um, easier to send across the network, easier to validate structures using numerical indices rather than like JavaScript string names and, and whatnot. And it was also designed to support things like streaming compilation, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But the main thing that really sort of allowed an easy transition began with WebGL. Um, prior to WebGL, we did not have an efficient way in JavaScript to represent arbitrary bytes. And therefore, low-level details like image processing and network jitter management and like all kinds of things that 
are, are well handled by low level bit fiddling and pointer arithmetic are not easily expressed in a language like JavaScript. It's not that there aren't other ways. It's just, it's not as natural of a fit as with a low level language. But the problem with most C and C++ code is that the stack and the heap are intertwined, right? And if you manipulate the heap, you can end up manipulating the stack and controlling uh, execution and, and take over somebody's computer. So that's not what we wanted. So when we talk about running C and C++ code in the browser, we're not literally talking about dynamic libraries or anything like that. We're talking about WebAssembly modules that have an abstraction over linear memory with type arrays, type, the, the typed arrays of um, JavaScripts around buffers that first showed up because WebGL needed to be able to send complex textures and, and model geometries and things like that down to the, the GPU efficiently. And so that was introduced there. WebAssembly built on that. And so now we can emulate pointer arithmetic without actually suffering the security risks of pointer arithmetic. So with that in mind, um, quick, if you wouldn't mind just like typing into the, the chat room quickly, uh, how many people have seen a fair amount about WebAssembly or is this pretty new to most people? I know Michael, Mike, you, you're, you said you're looking into it a lot. Okay, so it's, it seems like new to, to most people. So I'm gonna show you some demos that are based on this six year technology, six year old technology now. The first use case here is not a big one, but it's an, it's an important one. And a lot of people are, are concerned that WebAssembly's goal is to kill JavaScript. And that's not the case. But there's only so many hours in the day and software is taking over the world. So what we would like to do is to stop rewriting stuff that we don't need to rewrite. So as an example, um, I do a lot of API design stuff and play around with command line tools calling into, into APIs. And I love JQ. So this is a, a piece of portable C code, very clean and efficient. But the idea is if you invoke through curl or wget or HTTP pi or something, a call to an endpoint, you may end up with this big blob of JSON vomit that comes, comes back on the other side. And so if you take that and pipe that into JQ, it's like a little query language. You can say, strip off the first element or strip off the last element or grab the message um, key or the commit message key and then re-expose it as a key called message or whatever. So it's just, it's a very useful tool. It's not rocket surgery, right? It's, 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 it's a competent portable piece of code and there's no reason why it couldn't be written in JavaScript. The question is just simply why? Why would we have to rewrite it in JavaScript when we don't have to? So Robert Abu Khalil, who has a great resource called Level Up with WebAssembly, um, there are three levels you can you can get into it. There's like a $29 level, a $49 level, and a $129 level. But each one includes more and more things like screencasts and the capstone project to work on and, and whatnot. But he basically built a version of uh, a web page that uses JQ compiled to WebAssembly. So he created a WebAssembly module, he loaded it in the JavaScript. And so now you see this JSON here, we're selecting off the first element, but it's completely interactive. So if I go through and say, I want all the elements and I want the email from all of the elements, right? It's just a very efficient way of extracting data from, from JSON. Not that you could not do this in JavaScript, there's just no point. Recompile the C code, run it in the browser, and we get code reuse and, and we can focus on uh, other things. So that's just a not exciting, but you know, useful starting point uh, to, to, to deal with that. Well, if we can do command line tools, everyone's favorite command line tool would be like a compiler, right? So we have the Clang compiler, an LLVM based compiler compiled to WebAssembly. So the compilation process now runs in the browser. So I've got some arbitrary C code here. I'm now going to compile that C code into WebAssembly. Boop. So we have a little six kilobyte module now. That's not very big. I've had Java classes with longer names than that, 6,000 characters. Um, but I can now run this code directly in the browser. Now what's happening is the tool chain um, emits some API calls. So things that look like OpenGL calls are probably WebGL calls because the browser supports WebGL. The browser supports audio, the browser supports a variety of things. It's not actually making OS level calls directly. It's relying on capabilities that the browser provides. In, in this case, like a 2D accelerated uh, canvas drawing. But here's some C++ code 
that represents more complex 3D graphics. It's got a dependency on a matrix multiplication library because WebGL doesn't support that natively. So pull that in. We now have a new module that's 18 kilobytes, still nothing all that big. Download the model, and it's able to run in the browser. Now, if you look at the, the video, it's probably a little bit janky coming across that way. But in person, it's completely uh, smooth and pretty cool. So we now have a C compiler compile the WebAssembly so that the C compiler runs in the browser to compile C code in the browser to WebAssembly so that the C code runs in the WebAssembly. There's turtles in there somewhere, right? But then there's this kind of new vision of being able to build applications that work inside the browser or outside of the browser. And if we're thinking about desktop applications, um, you can imagine any number of user interface toolkits. But while I was researching the book, I came across one that a, a guy in Sweden did. He works in the, in the game industry. And you know, sometimes when you're building games, you need like a little UI component to take an input or you know, change a value. So you want to like pop up a little window with a slider in it. But you're within the context of like an OpenGL scene or a Direct3D scene. Um, so you're not going to pop up a WinForm API or something like that within the scene. Uh, so he would render the UI components um, using OpenGL um, kind of primitives. But he also wanted the tools to be useful outside the browser. And the idea is you could build applications that work in either case. So here is a demo of his, his, his tool chain. And it works exactly the same and looks exactly the same inside the browser as it does outside the browser. So we've got like you know little code editing snippets and UI components and widget galleries and you know plotting things. And if you take his code and recompile it outside of the browser, it looks exactly the same. And that introduces a new option for people building applications. So let me take a step here and take a step back and talk about .NET again. .NET has historically been been used for sort of business applications and, and things like that. Um, because it's a well-tooled environment. Uh, it didn't have the open source world that Java did for quite some time, but that's changing. It's just changed quite a lot recently. But at the end of the day, if you're a large corporation and you're building desktop applications in .NET, you still need to deploy them. And if you need to deploy them like a thousand times or 5,000 times or 10,000 times, because everybody in your company needs to have this business application installed, that is a non-trivial organizational effort. And so as much as businesses would love to stick with .NET in that case, um, or rely on ASP.NET and some of the, you know, the other technologies, um, that installation cost is still a killer. And so I think one of the things that drove interest in JavaScript frameworks over the last 10 years was a desire to just let enterprises benefit from the zero cost installation aspects of, of the web. And um, so suddenly you need to target Windows, Linux, Mac OS, the web is a great way of doing that. The platform has gotten to the point where it's got 2D graphic support, 3D graphic support, video support, uh, the Fetch API, uh, local storage. Like, there's just a lot we can do in this platform. And I think our industry was given permission to look at JavaScript frameworks because of that. And I think we kind of screwed it up, right? Because we chased shiny objects. Angular 1 to Angular 2. Well, that's not just a simple. Uh, evolution, that's a completely different shift. And then React, and then this, and then this other thing. And there was very little reuse across it. And one of the nice things about the programming models of C Sharp, Win components, and things like that, is the composability of software, the reusability of software. For a long time, obviously, you were tied to Windows, but with the emergence of Mono and some other technologies, and, and these days, directly from Microsoft, they're, they are now a cross-platform first company. Um, a lot of that has changed. And when people start to realize some of the things that are possible, I think it's gonna change back. And I think .NET is gonna have a much stronger place, at least in the client website of development uh, where it's, I think it's a lot of its strengths are. But other things like games are absolutely gonna benefit from this. So this won't work for you because I'm serving up locally, but this is the Unity engine Obviously, C Sharp is the, the main language for the Unity engine, but that gets compiled down to a series of assets that run on top of the platform. 
So if the platform has been compiled to WebAssembly, then the things that run on top of the platform will also run in, in the same space. So I've got a lot of things going on in my machine, so this, this normally starts up a little bit faster. But this is a famous um, 3D visualization walkthrough called Epic Zen Garden. And again, it's, it's gonna be janky on the video, um, but it's, it's smooth, it's got birds chirping in my ear. When you zero in on the water and you splash the water, it makes little psh, 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 water splashing sounds. I'm drawing the fish to me. And the point is, about four or five years ago, this was Apple's demonstration of the power of their phones. Because um, they had moved the metal API for doing 2D or 3D graphics, excuse me, 3D graphics and computation to these devices. They've run custom hardware on them to make them work really, really, really fast. And they were, they were using it to show off. Now that same basic capability runs in uh, Firefox on Mac OS, Chrome on Linux, Edge on Windows, and it's uh, it's it's uh, remarkable. Got a question about the performance difference? Um, I don't have a number to show you, but the idea is there will be a penalty, but they don't want it to be a big penalty. That's why they say near native performance speed um, in the execution of the, the website code, regardless of its runtime environment. So. Um, most things within the browser are perfectly fine from a, from a performance perspective. So the purpose of WebAssembly is not to replace JavaScript. The purpose of WebAssembly is to allow us to do what we want to do and not have to wait for the, um, the browser vendors to come to consensus. So right now, if we wanted to extend the behavior of the browser, we would have to get the 400 plus member organization W3C to agree that what we were suggesting was worth it. And then they would create a community group and they would do some exploration, some proof of concepts, some prior art, you know, that kind of stuff. Get into a working group that eventually would produce some standards. There'd be a lot of infighting. Google and Apple would throw their weight around like they do everywhere else. Um, and then a year from now, we would have a standard and maybe two or three years from now, we would start to see it show up in one or two browsers. It's maddening waiting for the sausages to be made, right? So instead, what we have the ability to do is to reuse code or to write code that solves certain problems elegantly in ways that maybe JavaScript doesn't. We're not throwing JavaScript away. We're just saying this part of the system doesn't make sense to write in JavaScript. And therefore, we can extend the capabilities of the browser rather than simply throw away JavaScript, which is not a goal. And so that's what Colin Eberhardt did here. He built a system that relied on existing tools and technologies and standards. He used WebRTC to get permission to access to the video camera. He used OpenCV, which is a C++ library recompiled to WebAssembly, to rotate the paper until it's flattened, right? He used TensorFlow compiled to WebAssembly to extract the givens, the, the black digits on the, the puzzle. He solved it with a Rust-based Sudoku solver and then rendered the solution in red appropriately rotated by going the other way with OpenCV. And this really gives you a sense of where we could go with the web. So the web is going to be this amazing intersection of services and capabilities and uh, new things that we can add all the time, like augmented reality and overlaying stuff with what we're seeing locally. Truly, truly tremendous um, work on, on Colin's part. I didn't get that. Um, I spend a fair amount of time teaching people about machine learning. And I often use Jupyter Notebooks. You've probably all kind of experienced that. And historically, Jupyter Notebooks would require us to start up um, a server because the, the idea is we have these cells that are either documentation cells or code cells. And the code could be in different languages, but the only language that runs in the browser, obviously, is Java. Script, Here's what excuse I found. Me. Shut up. Um, and so what happens is when you execute a cell, it takes the text of the cell sends it to a backend server, executes it there, and then sends the result back. Well, that's because Python doesn't run in the browser, except it does, right? So the Pyodide project was an attempt to get the Python browser to run, and then things that run on top of the Python, or the, the Python runtime, the C runtime on top of it, um, will run there as well. So now people have um, interesting, tools and uh, they're building network and notebook environments on, on top of the uh, 
the, the PyDide platform. So we have some things like a REPL. So I can just start up a console here and say, you know, uh, list so L equals a 2.345 AB. Uh, oh, sorry. I meant those to be strings. Right. This is just Python. Runs in the browser. This is now something called PyScript. So PyScript builds on Pyodide, which is this engine, right, that has been ported to WebAssembly. So we're starting to see a lot of things being built on top of other things being built on the top of other things. And it's really changing what's what's possible, including the idea of here's a, a SVG file. So when we think of SVG, we think of scalable vector graphics, obviously. But scalable vector graphic files can also have embedded JavaScript. So this one has an animation se sequence that runs you know periodically and determines where to place the the sand however it's doing so by using a physics engine so there's a physics engine written in c plus plus that understands the contours of the hourglass that's what the red line shows what 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 are we given to to the uh, the physics runtime it's called chipmunk is the, the name of the, the physics runtime and notice you know as the sand particles fall they kind of like slide over each other but you know, gravity's pulling them down through a bottleneck and it's kind of figuring out how to do it. It's got a fairly realistic feel to it, right? And of course, being animated, we can flip it and change gravity and then it's now going to pull stuff in, in the other direction. So that's pretty wild, particularly when I show you what's actually happening, which is the physics engine is updating DOM element positions in real time. Right, those sand particles are SVG DOM elements, and we are updating them in real time from the physics engine. And that really kind of starts again, shows you we're taking the web in entirely new places because we have the ability to extend extend this stuff. Oops, sorry, I did not mean to close that. That was actually one of my questions. Can you access the DOM from your WebAssembly? I guess so. Um, not directly, but you can call JavaScript, which can eventually. There will be a way to do that, but for now, that's that's not quite um, the. You can't do it directly, but there's there's no nothing you can't do because you can just call JavaScript code that does that. And here's where we find ourselves. You know, 28 years after I worked on the first Earth visualization environment, C++ based, running on silicon graphics workstations, thirty thousand dollar workstations, um, Google Earth now compiles to WebAssembly and runs in the browser. And does so portably, and with you know high performance. But it's also still running within the context of the browser, so it still has access to things like the Fetch API to go out and pull in images and things from Wikipedia relative to like in this case, doing uh, you know zeroing in on Kiev or some other part of the world. And again, this is this is what the web is going to become. It's it's not that the DOM is going away. It's that we don't have to think of just documents anymore. We can think of applications, we can think of video streams, we can think of, you know, all of these can be part of our understanding of, of the web. But then there's .NET. And you've probably heard of Blazor. If you haven't, this is one of Microsoft's new blessed ways of building applications for the web. And, you know, I don't point that out to people before I show this to them usually. Um, I just say, hey, look, here's a single page application. It's stateful. It can go out and fetch data from the web and bring it back. But then I say, let's load this again. And it may not be easy to see. Yeah, you should be able to read that. That's an awful lot of DLLs running in my Mac OS browser. And the reason is, The mono platform has been compiled to WebAssembly. So with Blazor, you have two choices. You can render on the server and then send down user interface elements that will communicate um, over our signal to the back end. 
or you could push the entire application down to the browser. Obviously, there's the penalty of pushing mono down first, but once you do that, you could cache the result. So you don't have to do that every single time. And here we're back to, well, as a programming environment, C Sharp is a lot easier to build and be productive in, I think, than JavaScript frameworks. I'm not saying they are fungible technologies. I'm not saying you can't do the same things or you can't do the same things. But as far as most business owners are concerned, this is a very cost-effective, powerful, expressive way of building business applications that are maintainable and you know easy to get your head wrapped around compared to the chasing of shiny objects that we have had in the last 10 years where most of the work that's been done is not reusable, right? If you build something in Angular 1, you can't really reuse much of that in, in a React application. They're getting better. They're getting better with component models and things like that now. But I think as soon as enterprises realize that you can now build, in essence, .NET applications as desktop applications that also are deliverable over the web, to Linux users, to Mac OS users, to Windows users with zero installation cost, that's going to be a really, really, really big shift. And so this is expressed using a combination of C Sharp and um, what do they call it, Razor, um, which is an XML based kind of composition language. And it's it's not direct desktop.net, but it's it's close. And I think it will become closer over time. And I think this is going to be an interesting future for you to be able to build .NET based business applications or anything really, and serve it up over the web safely, securely, performantly, and in a cross-platform way. So that's that's the part of the story that I think you'll find really exciting and, and interesting. But that's not the end of the story because Blazor is an example of a use case of .NET, of uh, WebAssembly that doesn't really highlight the WebAssembly. If you go back and look at how that process, that application is built, at no point do you really have to know anything about WebAssembly. WebAssembly is an implementation detail of turning Blazor into this uh, channel. Well, there's another platform called Uno. I don't know how, is this a widely familiar platform in the .NET space? They have historically given you the ability to build pixel-perfect um, multi-platform applications with C Sharp in WinUI across Windows, iOS, Android, Mac OS, and Linux. It looks the same, exactly the same. Now that's a strategy, right? When you have cross-platform code, you either want it to look the same everywhere or you want it to look like a native application everywhere. But they have basically built this platform built around Xamarin that allows you to target any of these platforms. So you can run on Windows, you can run on Android, you can run on Mac OS, but the browser was a, was a big old no for a long time until they found a way to reuse some existing rendering libraries, one called Skia, which is in and of itself a nice, useful uh, 2D visualization environment. Um, but they you can now use this as the basis of um, drawing things to Canvas and doing so with performance. So that becomes, again, Uno's entree to the web. And now your pixel perfect multi platform applications will run on Android, Windows, iOS, Mac OS, Linux, and in the browser without changing a single thing, without looking differently. And so if you look at the, the Uno gallery, again, this is an implementation detail. It has nothing to do, like you're not building WebAssembly modules and, and whatnot directly in this ecosystem, it's just an implementation detail. So we have the ability to build user interfaces that have different styles. So you can have a material style, the Fluent style, the Cupertino style, right? To target different um, looks and feels, or you can make your application, you know, just pick one and use all of them, right? you know, make it look the same on all platforms. So you can choose whether you want everywhere the same or kind of a native look and feel. But the actual development process is pretty straightforward. You have components. You assemble applications from components. The components are mixtures of XAML and uh, C Sharp in other places. So here we have a stack panel. Here's what it looks like. Here we have a view box. Here's what it looks like, right? Uh, cards. 
So you can build really nice cross-platform pixel perfect rendering of things that look the same everywhere on the back of, of this platform. But the, the difference is with Blazor and with Uno, um, you don't have to care about WebAssembly. It's just an implementation detail. So there's no single way to get into WebAssembly. You can do it at the low level if you want. You can do it um, through a variety of assistive techni technologies like Wasm Bindgen and some other ones, or you can just completely forget about it and reap the benefits of the fact that these platforms have been moved over uh, into that space. And what we're starting to see, like literally two or three weeks ago, I think, I don't remember exactly when this tweet was, October, so about just a couple months ago, here is a C-sharp and XAML app running in Microsoft Teams powered by the Uno platform. So you're now able to build components to target, like, you know, embedding inside other Microsoft Windows platforms, um, relying on these technologies as well. My point is just simply that we're finding more and more and more ways of benefiting from these. And this is, this is an example of something that's kind of interesting that just kind of popped up out of nowhere, right? So if you want to play around, here's a link to the GitHub repo. It's in the slides, which you have. Um, and it walks you through the, the code samples and everything to, to kind of get started. Again, I don't know what kind of interest you have in building embedded stuff in, in uh, Teams, but it's just it's an example of the kinds of, of use cases that, that are happening. So here's where we step outside of the browser and look at the bigger picture. And so what I've shown you so far is mostly based on six-year-old technology. It's just this portion of it. What we've seen since then is the emergence of things like streaming compilation. So now as you're downloading modules off the web, you're compiling them, leveraging local CPUs and, and whatnot. So by the time you pull your final byte across the web, you're ready to go. Whereas with JavaScript, that's when you start validating. So there's a speed up in terms of like how quickly we can be up and running. That's not the normal notion of performance. Right, in terms of like execution speed, it's just we don't have to wait to validate the JavaScript once it's all done building. We can be up and running before we go. We've got support for 64-bit addressing spaces and uh, certain types of parallelization, like single instruction, multiple data parallelization. The MVP left out garbage collection, threading, exception handling, and a bunch of other things because not every language supports those. And Rust and C Sharp or C++ and things like that. Um, have garbage collection, right? There's a very heavy, or, or, sorry, REST and C++ don't have garbage collection. So they didn't need to build that into the platform at the time. But there are proof of concepts of graphic, uh, of garbage collection, exception handling, tail call optimizations. So languages like Elm, Elixir, Java, things that have been sort of not part of the, the story up until now uh, can, can very much be part of the story in the future. Um, yeah, yeah, so there we go. Um, We've got the fact that a lot of JavaScript frameworks have started rewriting portions of themselves in Rust or C++. Historically, that would have been impossible. But things that just never actually performed all that well in JavaScript can be trivially rewritten in, in a language that allows ahead of time optimization and then can be called from the JavaScript environment as well in a completely transparent way. In the future, all WebAssembly modules are going to be ES6 modules. So all you're going to say is, hey, point to that thing, pull this function out of it and use it and you will literally not care what language it was written in. Node has always supported WebAssembly, as, as long as the browsers have, because sometimes you need to write portions of your application in a lower level language. But now we've got the JavaScript part and the native library part. And if I'm installing the Node application on Windows and you're on Linux, then we need the right version of the library. All that's gone. There's now just a WebAssembly module, and the WebAssembly module can be an NPM dependency like anything else. So Node loves it. Dino loves it. If you're not familiar with Dino, Dino is Ryan Dahl's Let's Get Node Right This Time a project. It's got a security sandbox, and it's got um, native support for TypeScript, and it's got native support for WebAssembly. Um, and so in JavaScript-based server environments, WebAssembly is absolutely part of the story. Um, we're seeing the emergence of new computational environments, like edge computing environments. So you're familiar with the concept of uh, cloud regions, and the purpose of the regions is to get closer to your customers. Well, what if you could get to on-prem, on-device, at the edge, at the edge of your customer's uh, communication provider and on-prem, somewhere in downtown um, Richmond, right? Have cell towers, have the ability to deploy microservices and serverless functions and things 
close to the customers, but not on their devices. And we can now start to place computation and data near the customers to have better low latency experiences. But if I'm taking arbitrary code written from arbitrary people in arbitrary languages, I'm gonna need an uh, ecosystem that is sandboxed and able to be capable of dealing with portable code. So we're seeing all kinds of interesting use cases. The Ethereum blockchain 2.0, it's virtual machine is written, it's a, it's a WebAssembly virtual machine. So we've got no end of, of uh, opportunities here. And we're seeing the emergence of things like the Bytecode Alliance, um, which is an emerging intersection of WebAssembly and WASI. Now I don't have time to go into WASI, but WASI is what's gonna make your applications portable, whereas WebAssembly makes your code portable. The stack machine can express arbitrary computation, but WebAssembly can't read from your file system or write to it or open up a network connection or spawn a thread unless you let it. So WASI is largely about giving a WebAssembly runtime only what you want to give it and only in a constrained kind of way, which is, I think, going to have a material impact on our uh, risks for things like malware and ransomware and whatnot. If I download arbitrary code from arbitrary people but run it in a sandbox, then those kinds of attacks become much, much harder. And so the Bytecode Alliance is in drawing the attention of Amazon, Arm, Cisco, Docker, Fastly, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Mozilla, Siemens, right? VMware. These are serious players who are now believing that at the intersection of these technologies is a new capacity to build secure software platforms. And now, because of some of the things that I'm talking about, .NET is an equal partner in, in any of these sorts of things, which is, which is really quite exciting. Then there are the unexpected things. Like again, while researching the book, I did not anticipate this. Microsoft's plugin mechanism for Flight Simulator has been replaced with WebAssembly modules because C++ is too hard to get secure. And so you can still write the code in C++, but you're going to compile it into a WebAssembly module, and then it will be sandboxed and portable and not able to break out of it like it normally would be able to potentially as a, as a native C++ library. We're seeing um, Envoy and um, some other sort of like runtime um, network-oriented technology stack implementations allowing you to write plugins using WebAssembly now too. And again, these are like very, very performance oriented, bit oriented kinds of routing mechanisms um, will be expressible in whatever language you want to as well. So this whole plugin environment uh, idea is becoming so ubiquitous that there's now a universal plugin standard called XDISM. And you could write code in any of these languages and then load them into any of these languages. So from within .NET, you can load plugins written in OCaml. And in JavaScript, you could load you know, code or plugins written in Ruby. From Ruby, you could pull in Go, Go modules. This is, this is crazy. That's amazing. <laughs> so it has to do with creating a basically a WASI runtime. There are a couple of them out there. There's WASM time um, from Mozilla. This is a, a nice big open source one, part of the Bytecode Alliance. But there's also WASMR. So they've got support for a wide variety of languages and runtimes um, and some really cool ideas about what does this look like. Um, there is Thicket State that has this really nice kind of like lightweight footprint. Um, anything from like serverless infrastructures to automotive systems to um, cloud-based, uh, you know, Kubernetes structures and things like that. But they also have the ability to do stuff like, oh, hey, take this module, post it to an endpoint, and now invoke it as a service. And it's doing things like facial recognition and images, right? So we can take AI kinds of capabilities and post them as reusable serverless functions in, in all these different places. So plugins, extension mechanisms, nobody wants to write those 15 times for 15 languages. We're not going to have to. We're going to be able to pick a language and then target any of these runtimes quite easily. Then the final .NET sort of specific thing that I want to point you to um, is this discussion. Um, you know, .NET's uh, the seven version um, added support for WebAssembly and WASI as as a target. So now directly from within your tool chains, you're going to be able to target these environments, and that's going to allow you to write code that not only runs on Windows 
but also runs on Linux and Mac OS, x86-based architectures, ARM-based architectures. And through this combination of WASI and other sorts of technologies, you will probably find Entree even into things like microcontrollers. So WASM3 is um, a very cool system that allows you to use um, the runtime in any of these languages and allows you to target things like Arduino and Raspberry Pis and other kinds of microcontroller based environments. So when we say this is like write once run everywhere, we mean this is like literally write once run, run everywhere, but with like 30 years of experience to avoid making the mistakes that I think Sun and um, Oracle have, have done. So you could deploy to FreeBSD, you can employ, employ to uh, routers, right? Add services to open router environments and whatnot. It's it's really quite exciting uh, where where we're going with this stuff. So there's this new. Would you be running those under a browser, like on a Raspberry Pi? You'd have to have a browser that would load it, nope. or could you? No, no, no. So it? these are these are WebAssembly runtimes. So Wasmer and WasmTime and uh, uh, Second Edge are all platforms. But with the Extism uh, plugin system, you could have a .NET application whose plugins are written using other languages. Gotcha. So you execute these. Uh, using one of those, uh, the Ectism or Wasner or Second State. And so you load those, and then you can run any one of these WebAssembly uh, plugins or components. Or That's a, that's the plan. Right? Uh, Again, so many things are happening so quickly. Um, you know, Some of this is still a work in progress, but it is it is happening so quickly. Uh, it's really hard to keep keep track of it. My book came out a year ago, and I just approached a I'm like, is it time for a second edition? Because <laughs> things are changing so fast. They said they want to wait a little bit more, but and that, that's fine because we need the, um, the WebAssembly uh, object the component model and some of those other things to settle down. Um, I think before it really is going to make sense to to write the second version of the book. But all of this is happening amidst a couple of other industry trends. That includes the emergence of hardware as a differentiator, but also the desire for IT sovereignty. Right. Western companies don't trust Chinese technologies. Chinese technologies don't trust American technologies. Europeans are looking at what's happening to like supply chain attacks, uh, not supply chain attacks, excuse me, supply chain disruptions because of the pandemic and because of the war in Ukraine. And what is Russia gonna have to do to get high-end electronics, right? People are realizing that global world that we had of very low overhead, you know, supply chain on demand kinds of stuff works great until it doesn't. And so we have the European Processor Initiative. We've got the emergence of RISC-V as an open source ISA. Apple's using ARM and customizing it, but they're writing ARM really big checks to do so. If you have the ability to have an extensible open source ISA, you don't have to write any big checks to anybody. And I saw recently it was estimated that like typical you know, grad students with a computer architecture background can basically create new chips in like a month right, for about $14,000, which is just unbelievable because the, the startup costs used to be millions of dollars for new hardware. And so I mentioned this because our world is about to get even more complicated from a hardware perspective because India is getting into chip manufacturing. China is getting into CPU manufacturing in ways that they haven't necessarily in the past. And so in, in Europe as well. So I think we're going to end up with like lots of little environments that have slightly off kinds of instructions and register you know, values and things like that, we're going to need an ecosystem that runs on all of it. And I think through the combination of LLVM and WebAssembly, we're getting there. And and I've shown you, you know, significant evidence of that. Um, you brought up that uh, LLVM again. So, Brian, I'm going to ask you about that. Uh, so, I'm slightly confused on the so LLVM can also do some of these things you described where, you know, you can compile any language to one thing and then run it everywhere. So, it's <clears throat> like half of it sounds like it's a competitor. It sounds like LLVM is a competitor to WebAssembly, uh, but then you can take LLVM and turn it into WebAssembly. But I know some things use that approach and some things don't. And I was reading the Google Earth page. They said they're currently going directly to WebAssembly, mm -hmm. but they'd like to go through LLVM in the future. So like, okay, how does LLVM fit into WebAssembly world? So first of, first of all, LLVM is used literally everywhere. Not necessarily in ways that you would have understood, you would have necessarily, you know, noticed. But Julia is an LLVM-based language. Swift is an LLVM-based language. Um, Rust is an LLVM-based language. In my exploration, uh, I, I'm not really a language guy. I mean, I, 
I, I can teach myself anything. I just get really tired of the feature fetish. Like, oh, this language does this, this language does that. I just want to build useful stuff, right? So when I first heard about Rust and Go many years ago, I kind of put them in the same category. But because I'm an old school Unix dork, Ken Thompson and, and Rob Pike's association with Go kind of drew me to that initially. But then I heard that Rust was emitting WebAssembly natively. And the reason was because it's an LLVM-based mechanism. And all they needed to do was change the backend. Right? So now they can emit WebAssembly directly as opposed to x86 instructions, ARM instructions, RISC V instructions. And when, when WASI was announced, there became a WebAssembly WASI backend that will emit like standard library links to open up a file system or open up a network connection or things like that. But it's going to rely on the WASI environment to actually provide that capability or not. So LLVM is an enabling technology for WebAssembly, but WebAssembly is also an enabling technology for LLVM in the sense that it's finding use in all of these different places, like Clang running in the browser, right? So they're compatible technologies. They're not competitors. They're definitely compatible technologies. Um, and I think you will see both of those uh, being used in, in more and more places. Any other questions before I kind of wrap up? So I've got some links in here, and I encourage you to check them out. Wasm Edge, like I said, um, is is a runtime, but they're also doing some really interesting things um, for like serverless functions and uh, interesting web extensions and and whatnot. So you may want to check them out. Fermion's doing quite a lot of uh, interesting work in the intersection between WebAssembly and cloud. They've just released a content management system built in WebAssembly called Bartholomew. They've got um, a component model called SPIN, which is influencing some of the um, the component model standards. So I'm just highlighting them as companies that are innovating in, in the space. Suborbital just got a huge round, round of funding for um, allowing you to build extensions to your SaaS applications in WebAssembly, but also to deploy to cloud cloud systems and basically you know reuse code in, in a variety of environments. Now, they use Kubernetes when it makes sense to. More times than not, it does not make sense to. And if you're like assembling or orchestrating services of like low level actors, there's zero reason to involve the overhead and complexity of Kubernetes to that. But there are also plugins and other little little kinds of things that are that are part of that story. Um, so that WebAssembly and Kubernetes do work nicely together. The point is something like Kubernetes will just fade into the infrastructure, right? It's gonna be plumbing. It's gonna be something that we use when we need to. It's not gonna be the dominant organizing principle of how we build software. And we're starting to see that happen with what these companies are doing. And Wasm Cloud is another example that had a very interesting experience. Um, uh, a consulting company in London called Red, Pan uh, Red Badger built a system that scaled across three separate cloud providers. Try doing that with Kubernetes, right? It's just, it's not gonna be the right abstraction. And so what they have drawn our attention to is the fact that this is the arc that we've been on. You used to have to buy your computers, set them up, install all the software, network them, air condition them. And then AWS comes along and says, we will virtualize the machine. So you worry about the image on top of this, and then you could spin up as many instances of these wants. And that's a direct function of the ubiquity and efficacy of Linux as a way of saying, nobody pays for operating system licenses anymore. So now I could spin up as many of these as I want. Prior to that, our architectures were all about like, don't make me buy another Sun machine. Don't make me buy another IBM R6000. So our architectures you know, were, were kind of constrained by the licensing costs and, and whatnot. But now when I could just spin up as many of these instances as I want and not have a per instance licensing fee, that solves some of those problems. Then you know, Linux um, containerization starts to catch up to FreeBSD and Solaris and the, the sort of virtualization can be narrower and narrower and narrower. So the overhead becomes lower and lower and lower. You mix in Docker containerization and, and things like that. And all you have to do is worry about the dependencies that you need the environment to have. And then your code will run in this more efficiently scalable, virtualizable sub portion of the operating system. Well, WebAssembly comes along and says, look, we don't even have to worry about like versions of libraries anymore, right? 
all you need to do is write your application and it will literally run anywhere. But then these environments like Fermion and Suborbital and Watson Cloud and whatnot are, are taking the abstraction even further and saying, look, we will virtualize capabilities, right? You need the ability to store key value pairs. I'll give you the ability to store key value pairs. You need the ability to you know, write to a file. I will give you the ability to write to a file. It may be local storage, or it may be your S3 bucket, or it may be Filecoin. Your application doesn't know and it doesn't care. It's writing to like a WASI interface. It's getting a WASI provider, and that WASI provider will make it actually work or not, depending on whether we want it to or not. So all we really have to focus on is the business logic. And so they have an actor model that um, are basically going to be as exactly as Michael is suggesting. These are mockable, testable things. So our business logic can be demonstrated to work. And then we just sort of deploy it and scale it and orchestrate it as we need to uh, through things like Docker and, and Kubernetes and you know whatever else is going to emerge uh, around those. But this is really you know part of the trend that we're on. So when you look at movements towards decentralized systems when you move you know moving some stuff into the cloud locating the code and the data where it needs to be so that it is um low latency low overhead but it's also portable and safe then you kind of get a sense of of what our infrastructure and our server-based uh deployments are going to look like in the future and right now that's even more exciting and more there's more momentum there uh for WebAssembly than even in the browser with the six-year-old technology that's doing amazing things that, that I showed you. So that's that's the story. I'm sticking with it. .NET is now increasingly becoming a, a first-class citizen in this space through the emergence of the, the direct support of .NET 7, through things like Mono being compiled to run in any of these environments, through Blazor, through Platform Uno. And the cool thing about all of this is we're only relying on WebAssembly where we need to. Right? We're not saying start from scratch. We're saying, oh, let's virtualize this layer, or let's let's add in this support, or let's you know allow you to bring this other thing in. And so I find it particularly interesting from a use case perspective that most of the .NET um, integration points beyond WASI direct support are largely about sweeping this under the rug. Like you just don't even have to think about it. It's just an implementation detail, and that will will be a, a big useful um, benefit as well. So you don't have to buy into the whole thing. You don't have to deal with low-level details. You can just benefit from from uh, other people choosing to use it as as well. So I'm firmly of the opinion that literally everything about what we do will be touched in some way by this, but not in an intrusive way, right? It's more about let me be an enabling technology to let you do what you want to do and get better code reuse, avoid some security problems, avoid having to rewrite everything all the time. And these are sort of the, the collective use cases. Oh. One final thing, um, I don't know how many of you are following these sorts of things, but uh, DuckDB, which is a SQL OLAP database, now runs in the browser, as does Where's wow. the, there we go. Well, you can now run Postgres in the browser. You might say, well, why would I want to do that? Well, why wouldn't you want to do that, right? You can push your data. You can sync your data to your browser, have your local JavaScript application or .NET application, right, running in the browser, call into the database and do structured queries and things like that as, as well. Um, SillaDB is, is starting to uh, allow you to write user-defined functions in using WebAssembly. So now we can stop saying, pull too much data out do the aggregation and filtering in the application space, and then like write some results back. You can do that all directly in the browser now, in the database in the browser. So our entire notion of what it means to be a software develop developer is, is changing in, in pretty cool, exciting ways. And uh, I hope this is interesting and um, you've got um, some, some things to play around with. The, let me give you the slides again, just to make sure that you have them. So that slide, um, there may be some problems that like, you can't click through the links and the PDFs that are generated, but if you just copy the, um, the URL and go to them, you shouldn't have any problems with that. Any questions? Not really smart enough to ask questions on this. 
but a very good talk. Cool. Well, let me know if you if you have any questions. Um, What's the limitations there, Brian? What, what did you not tell what, us? What, what can you not use WebAssembly for? Um, ultimately, nothing. For the time being, I will say debugging WebAssembly is kind of a non-starter. But the good news is you just debug it using your normal debugging tools and then barf out the WebAssembly. And, and that doesn't generally introduce a lot of bugs. Um, so polyglot systems tend to be pretty hard to debug. But Mozilla has demonstrated using source maps and whatnot the, the capacity to debug Rust in the browser. So it, there's, there's no technical reason we can't. It's just a chicken and egg problem. Nobody, you know, Mozilla's trying to make money. They're not going to go and you know build a lot of supporting tools that um, may or may not be used in the short term. But the people are already building development tools um, in in the browser as well. So I would say uh, some of the tooling is emerging um, slowly. Debugging is part of that. Um, and the other thing that I would say is there's a, um, a veneer of ease that isn't untrue, but isn't as easy to acquire as perhaps I have suggested, right? There, there is still some like rough patches. There are solutions to, to getting around them, but, um, they're people are changing what they're trying to do so rapidly that even just you know as a function of the evolution of use cases is is making things um, older ways of doing things not as useful as newer ways of doing things. And I think WASI was a very clean concept. The component model is a tremendously complex. Um, ultimately, it's a tremendously complex solution. Most of that will be hidden by tooling. But right now, they're having to tease through a lot of really, really complex abstractions to get it right. And I think they will. There may be some missteps, but um, that needs to get solved in its entirety before I think we can really have the, the ease of fluidity of code running in any of these environments that, that I've, I've projected. Um, clearly, it's possible, but I think it's going to be easier and easier and easier to, to get that fluidity in, in the future. So it's, it's really, the major pain points are really just growth pains. And the growth pains are largely of a chicken and egg um, nature. And there's, there's no real issues. It's just a question of there has to be enough interest and momentum um, in a particular scenario to, to get Microsoft to modify the compiler to generate WebAssembly, right? But that's clearly happened. So I think those historical hiccups and road bumps and complexities are gonna become fewer and fewer as, as we go. WebAssembly is a plugin model, and you know, Flight Simulator using that. That's like I had no idea that this is like I had zero idea. I had not heard that, and that makes a lot of sense. But my mind is kind of blown. <laughs> it's really awesome, though. I mean, you you can write a plugin in any language and still have it work. That is kind of mind blowing. That, that's like mm -hmm. a next level stuff, right? Like yeah. that's that's huge. Um, so, I, I think. To, also to your question, like the scope of what's possible is just so overwhelming that it, people kind of get a per, uh, analysis paralysis. Uh, like, I don't know where to start. Um, and so that's why I kind of like try to break it up into, well, do you want to target the web? Do you want to target outside the web? You know, leave little little uh, trails to follow. Um, but it's I think it's all going to be better. Very amazing. Very amazing. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, uh, this is truly enlightening for me. Um, sure. And I, I just want to say also um, to, to Michael's comment there, it's almost like WebAssembly is turning the browser into a universal operating system. That's exactly what it's doing. Um, and and something like Chrome OS is going to make a lot more sense in, in that world. So. But I mean, like Flight Simulator using it for a plugin model, it's not even having anything to do with the browser. Like it's even out of the browser now. It, it's more of a universal polyglot connector, you know? <laughs> yeah. So let me, let, me, let, me, let me throw a couple of quick other things at you. Um, I mentioned the my company, Parabon. So we, we were pre-cloud, right? This is 1999, 2000. Um, we were doing things that were just like literally impossible for even Celera Genomics, which was to like scale gene sequence comparisons linearly. Um, we had a NASA researcher who would take nine months to run a thermospheric simulation he came to us, 
he ported his Fortran into Java in a week and then was able to run his job from Greenbelt, Maryland, fly to San Francisco and get his results in his hotel. So that's the power of parallelization. But what we did was um, we gave him the ability to, to tap into it. But we also forced him to change his code from Fortran to Java. And what I'm suggesting now is, A, nobody would do that today. And B, you don't have to do that today, right? You just recompile it with WebAssembly and it'll run. But we were trying to protect the, the people's computers that we were using, and Java was really the only option back then. We ran on eight platforms. Um, but this this problem that 23 years ago would involve rewriting stuff goes away in, in, this, in this new world. And so I, I think, you know, why would Microsoft be interested in this? Because you get the benefit of reusing the existing plugins, but you lose the risk of the security of running native C++ libraries at the OS level, right? And then if people want to use Rust, if people want to use other programming languages, then um, that's that's going to be an option as well. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, and, and kind of to add to that too, especially as a, a plugin system, I mean, and, and you touch on this a little bit too with WebAssembly, there's such a good sandboxing security model there that if I if I were writing a plugin system, it only makes sense for me to use WebAssembly because I, I can contr completely control what it has access to in the system and, and and everything. And so I can run completely untrusted code and still know that it's going to be sandboxed. And uh, yep. that, that's that's a huge benefit to anybody that's looking to build anything that's extensible or pluggable and, and whatnot, which is why Flight Simulator and why all the, a lot of these other systems are, are going exactly to that model. Or even just having dependencies, right, to avoid supply chain attacks, right? That, that's the, this is this is not only making our lives easier as developers and allowing us to get more reuse, it's also solving materially complicated security problems as as well. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and uh, good luck with your new new scheme. Um, and uh, see you later, Virginia. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Brian. Thanks, Fantastic Brian. presentation. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, come check us out next month, Thursday, February 2nd, where uh, Chris Lorenzo will present on intro to web components. Chris is actually here today. So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, looking forward to that presentation. Uh, make sure you guys come and check it out.